Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India friends i welcome you to the 19th session of our course on adr and arbitration we are now discussing uh, more amicable methods of dispute resolution uh, by now we have understood three basic processes in 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 this course one is arbitration the second one is conciliation which is there in part 3 of arbitration conciliation act and we also discussed the concept of negotiation so now we are discussing more amicable methods conciliation as we said in the last class uh, conciliation is the process where a conciliator assists parties to reach to an amicable settlement conciliator plays proactive role and the role of conciliator was identified in sections 67 75 we also saw as to how confidentiality plays an important role in the process of conciliation we introduced the idea of negotiation which is a system where parties are talking to each other to come out with a solution to their dispute we identified some of the impediments in the process of negotiation we said that negotiation at times does not succeed because of the fact that parties tend to maximize their gain parties tend to focus more on their interests and if they forget this point that they have to give up something to get something then in that case the chances of negotiation succeeding will be low and therefore towards the end of our last lecture i said that this is these are the reasons why we need guided negotiations we need negotiations to be guided by a neutral third party and when it is a guided negotiation the process becomes what we call as mediation see mediation or the term mediate is derived from the latin word mediare which means to be in the middle now this itself is good enough to explain the meaning of this this process there is somebody who is there in the middle between the two parties mediation is a process in which the mediator a neutral person works with the parties to find a solution which is acceptable to all but the mediator does not impose his decision on the parties we we have similarity here a mediator is a neutral person a conciliator is also a neutral person a mediator works with the parties to find a solution which is acceptable to all a conciliator assists parties to reach to an amicable settlement a mediator does not impose his decision on the parties a conciliator also does not impose his decision on the parties he does not have the authority to resolve it the resolution has to come from the parties same is the case here so definitely one obvious question will be what is the difference between mediation and conciliation we'll talk about that difference later on but what is important here mediator is a neutral third party who is working along with the parties to come out with a settlement which is acceptable to both mediator is not imposing his opinion mediator controls the process mind mediator controls the process it is actually controlled negotiation it is actually guided negotiation so mediator controls the process he guides the parties but the outcome the outcome remains in the hands of the parties mediator controls the process but the outcome has to come from the parties so therefore mediation is an amicable process of settlement of dispute between the parties with the help of a neutral third party called as mediator the definitions make it very clear that the role of mediator is to bring parties together on an agreement that is the role of mediator how the mediator has to perform it what are the statutory mechanisms do we have statutes which provide for mediation 
What is the law relating to mediation at international level? What are the stages of mediation? What are the characteristics of a mediator? All these things will be discussed in this lecture. So, in the simplest form, mediation means a process of negotiation facilitated by a third party. So, essentially, as I have already mentioned, mediation is controlled negotiation. It is a process in which negotiation is facilitated by a neutral third party. The characteristics of mediation are the classic characteristics of any ADR process. What attracts disputants towards mediation? Because I may tell you that recently the approach, our approach has been to promote mediation as a mode of dispute resolution. And here I am mainly talking about commercial mediation. I am not talking mostly about the mediation which we do in, in, in family law, in matrimonial disputes. There also mediation is fairly successful. But I am mainly focusing on mediation of commercial disputes. We do not have a statute exclusively for it. But recently government has initiated the process. The mediation bill has been passed by one of the houses of the parliament. Very soon it will become a reality. Why we are doing it? Are we a party to some convention? Is there any model law on the point of mediation? Is the world moving in the direction of medi making mediation as a preferred mode of dispute resolution? As of now, in most of our bilateral investment treaties with other countries, we keep arbitration as a preferred mode of dispute resolution. After going through this session, you will be in a position to make an opinion as to should the government think to replace arbitration by mediation in those bilateral investment treaties as the preferred mode of dispute resolution. Let us see. Let us see what government does. Why are we promoting mediation? Because of inherent merits in the process of mediation. Mediation is voluntary, right? It is voluntary. Arbitration is also voluntary. For that matter, any ADR process is voluntary except some statutes, for example, Commercial Courts Act, which mandates that pre-trial mediation is mandatory, except for those, usually mediation is voluntary. It is empowering, empowering in the sense that parties remain in control of whatever is happening. Parties have to evolve the settlement. Parties can come out of the process. It is empowering. At any stage, parties can come out of the process. Therefore, what I am saying, it is party centered. It is not mainly controlled by the neutral third party. It is not like litigation, which is a case where parties feel helplessness. They cannot control processes. Mediation is party centered. centered. The process is cordial. That is where you have the role of a neutral third party. The mediator will ensure that the environment rem remains cordial. Parties do not start talking at each other. There is no heat and exchange of words. It is a flexible process. The steps which we will discuss, I will suggest those steps make it very flexible. It is an efficacious process. In the process of mediation, you have something called as caucus, where the mediator meets with parties individually and gets informations which may be of great use in getting parties together to find a solution. That makes it a very efficacious process. It is cost effective definitely, less time consuming. If parties hold their positions and the space which has to be bridged is very wide, then it will take a lot of time for parties to move towards a settlement. But if they are very close to a meeting point, then mediation may be very effective in bringing them together on one platform. So it is less time consuming. It is cost effective. It is a confidential process, same as conciliation. Nothing of mediation proceeding will have to be disclosed. It is all confidential. And confidentiality is one of the reasons why disputants are attracted towards alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. I just mentioned the mechanism of caucus where mediator talks to the parties individually. 
and that is the stage when parties express their emotions express their concerns to the extent that parties are inclined to even disclose their trade secrets know hows without fearing of any breach of confidentiality so this is what the mediator has to tell to the parties that this is a confidential process the confidence has to be generated in the confidentiality of the process then solutions can be very creative very flexible yes solutions have to be within law you cannot settle outside law but within law the there is tremendous flexibility for the parties to settle their matter the solutions can be very creative solutions can be very flexible the fact that mediator is an independent third party he is not biased the fact that he is not biased the fact that he is not connected with one of the parties that also generates lot of confidence in the disputants that a neutral resolution of dispute will be done these are the classic characteristics of mediation process it is voluntary it is empowering it is party centered the environment remains very cordial the whole process is very flexible it is an efficacious process the concept of caucus makes it very efficacious it is cost effective less time consuming confidentiality is the hallmark of mediation solutions can be very creative solutions can be very flexible and most importantly parties know that the mediator is an independent person is a neutral person he won't be biased because of these characteristics i said parties are attracted towards mediation now let's first of all see what are the developments at international level same like the model law of arbitration you have the ancestral model law this is a soft law approach this is a soft law approach this is not a convention if you recall i said the philosophy behind ancestral model law on international commercial arbitration was that all the countries may adopt it and that is how there will be harmonization of laws even if you don't want to adopt it in its entirety you may adopt the essence of it the philosophy underlying the model law even if you adopt that much that should be sufficient to bring some kind of harmonization we are not unifying it we are not making it identical that all the countries must have identical law but it must be by and large harmonized why by and large harmonized same is the reason here why does ancestral propose a model law in mediation ancestral stands for un commission on international trade law why should a body which is there to promote international trade propose laws on dispute resolution because an efficient dispute resolution is a precondition for efficient international trade no trader would like to get into litigation in india which lags and drags in courts for years together therefore ancestral is promo promoting more amicable methods more private methods of dispute resolution we studied the model law of arbitration now we have model law on international commercial mediation i already said that we are focusing mainly on commercial mediation the subject here is international commercial mediation model law has been proposed by ancestral it is on international commercial mediation and international settlement agreement resulting from mediation how to do an international commercial mediation and what shall happen with the settlement agreements which result from mediation this is the agenda of ancestral model law how to do an international commercial mediation and what will happen with the settlement agreements resulting from mediation this is of 2018 the model law is designed to assist state parties in reforming and modernizing their laws on mediation procedure those countries which have mediation laws in existence will have to modernize it update it reform it those countries which do not have mediation law will have to frame a law along the lines of ancestral model law it gives us uniform rules for what for mediation process it encourages use of mediation and it tries to ensure 
predictability and certainty in its use. Therefore, there are set rules. It encourages that parties must adopt mediation as a mode of dispute resolution. Adopt these set of rules. And if you adopt same set of rules, the whole process is predictable. There is a lot of certainty. And certainty is a value in any method of dispute resolution. Predictability is an important virtue. It's an important value in any dispute resolution mechanism. Initially, it was adopted in 2002. It was known as Model Law on International Commercial Conciliation. Initially, it covered the procedure for conciliation. Now, it has been amended in 2018. A new section has been added on settlement agreement and their enforcement. This is a new thing arising out of mediation. This model law deals with all the aspects of mediation. Procedural aspects of mediation such as appointment of mediator, commencement of mediation process, conduct of mediation, termination of mediation proceedings, communication between mediator and the parties, confidentiality, admissibility of evidence in other proceedings, Many of these things are covered in part 3 of Arbitration Conciliation Act. We just discussed it in the previous lecture. Confidentiality, communication between the, the conciliator and the parties, admissibility of evidence in other proceedings. These are there in part 3. We are familiar with these provisions. So, if at all we make a law tomorrow on mediation, we will not find it difficult to incorporate these provisions because we are familiar with these aspects of ADR. It also provides for post-mediation issues, whether mediator can act as an arbitrator, what will be the, what will happen to the settlement agreement, what shall be the law for enforceability of settlement agreement, under what circumstances relief may be refused. So, all these aspects, procedural aspects are covered in the model law of 2018. The idea is the countries must adopt the model law in its entirety. Even if they do not adopt it in, in, in its entirety, if they adopt it substantially, that should be sufficient. Or even if they adopt the philosophy behind it, that should also be sufficient to bring some kind of harmonization at international level. So, this is about the soft law approach, the ancestral model law on international commercial mediation and international settlement agreements resulting from mediation 2018. Another approach is hard law approach. This is a UN convention. You remember we had UN conventions in arbitration also, the United Nations, the New York Convention of 1958. That was a hard law approach. And when the countries were making arbitration law, they had both the documents, the New York Convention, Geneva Convention, and they also had the ancestral model law to follow. Same is the case here. The United Nations Convention on International Agreements Resulting from Mediation, 2018. The UN Convention on International Settlement Agreements Resulting from Mediation. This is also popularly known as Singapore Convention on Mediation. Singapore Convention on Mediation. It was adopted in December 2018. We are a signatory to this Singapore Convention. We have not ratified it yet. We need to make a law. A municipal law has to be made. As I just said, government has started the process. The bill has been passed in one of the houses. It will very soon become a reality. Once it is passed, we may think of ratifying the Singapore Convention on Mediation. This convention applies to all the settlement agreements resulting from mediation. This is a hard law approach. This is a hard law approach. We just saw a soft law approach in the form of ancestral model law. This is UN Convention. It is popularly known as Singapore Convention on Mediation. It applies to all the Settlement agreements resulting from mediation. It establishes a harmonized legal framework for settlement agreements. 
as well as it also provides for the enforcement of settlement agreements. The convention is an instrument for the facilitation of international trade and promotion of mediation as an alternative and effective method of resolving trade disputes. I have been emphasizing on this point since my first lecture. An efficient dispute resolution mechanism for trade disputes is a precondition for promotion of international trade. This convention also tries to promote international trade by providing an effective dispute resolution mechanism for resolution of trade disputes, trade disputes. An efficient dispute resolution mechanism for resolution of trade disputes is a precondition as I have been saying for promotion of international trade. It is a binding international instrument and because it is a binding international instrument, it is expected that it will bring, bring certainty, predictability, stability to the international framework on mediation. This convention is consistent with the ancestral model law. The Singapore convention is consistent with the ancestral model law. So therefore, it will not be a problem for the countries to adopt either of these. Now, because the two are consistent with each other, the ancestral model law and the Singapore convention, because these two are consistent, the approach helps the state parties to adopt either of these or to adopt both of these and therefore, it is an efficient approach so that a comprehensive legal framework on mediation can be prepared by the state parties. If you recall, we had the New York Convention on Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards. In relation to arbitration, we had New York Convention of 1958. We had New York Convention of 1958. Just like New York Convention, the Singapore Convention also facilitates the recognition and enforcement of settlement agreements. You remember we said that New York Convention is for the recognition and enforcement of foreign awards. Singapore Convention provides for recognition and enforcement of settlement agreements. So, once we adopt it, the situation will be that the settlement agreement shall be directly enforced by the court. A settlement agreement will not be treated like a contract, the breach of which will be brought before the court for remedy. No, that will not be the scene. As of now, if there is no law, then any settlement agreement essentially remains an agreement. A settlement agreement arising out of conciliation process is enforceable by virtue of part 3 of the Arbitration Conciliation Act. But in case of mediation, a settlement agreement is not enforceable as such because there is no law prescribing for enforcement. In the absence of any such law, what happens? A settlement agreement is only a contract and it is only in case of breach that we can go to a court for remedies. That will not be the situation once we adopt this convention. It will be enforced directly in a court of law. Because just like New York Convention, the Singapore Convention also provides for enforcement of the outcome of mediation process. So, after having understood the meaning of mediation, the characteristics of mediation and the international development in relation to commercial mediation, let us now see how mediation evolved in India. See, prior to the advent of British adversarial system, we had amicable methods of dispute resolution in India, village panchayats, etc. These were there, but let us not go in history in that detail. What happened once the British adversarial system, the system of litigation got firmly established in India, the only alternative which was recognized was arbitration. And if you recall, I said arbitration started in the form of regulations in the late 18th century itself. In 1795, the regulation of Bengal was extended to Banaras. So, arbitration became an option, but that was also not there in a very systematic manner. The regulations lacked clarity. But mediation was not in discussion. 
mediation in its present form and unlike its ancient form, we had mediation in ancient India. Mediation in its present form and unlike its ancient form became known and acceptable to legal fraternity in a recent times. It's a recent development. In fact, in India, people started talking about mediation only after the coming into force of Legal Service Authorities Act. Legal Services Authority Act 1989 recognized the principle of mediation. You must have heard about the concept of Lok Adalat. In Lok Adalats, we adopt the method of mediation for resolution of disputes. And with the advent of the system of Lok Adalat, we recognized the concept of mediation in its present form. And it gained momentum, it gained popularity after as a mode of dispute resolution after 1987. Now, in addition to the 1987 Legal Services Authority Act, we also have Section 89 of CPC, which talks about court annexed ADR or court induced ADR. We have discussed Section 89 in our previous lectures. We have said that if the court is of the opinion that there exists elements of settlement between the parties, then court will formulate the terms of settlement and send the parties for one of the modes of settlement mentioned in section 89. There are four modes mentioned there and one of the modes is mediation. And therefore, rules were framed under CPC within which a mediation has to be effected by the court in case parties are referred for mediation of their disputes. So therefore, gradually we are moving in the direction of accepting mediation as, as a viable alternative to litigation. Because initially it was arbitration which was considered as an alternative. So now mediation in its present form is acceptable as I discussed internationally also after 2018 you have convention, you have a model law. We are going to have a mediation act very soon in our country. So it is, it appears to be an acceptable method. But in the beginning itself, if you recall, I said there are two processes which appear to be very close to each other, very identical to each other, very similar to each other. The conciliation process and the mediation process. In both these processes, there is a neutral third party who is involved. In both these processes, the neutral third party is not resolving the dispute. The resolution has to come from the parties then what is the difference between mediation and conciliation? The difference between these two lie in terms of the role performed by the conciliator and the mediator. Conciliator has an active role, whereas the mediator only assists the parties throughout the mediation process. Conciliator has a more active role. So the difference between mediation and conciliation is based on the role played by the neutral third party. Mediator acts as a facilitator who helps parties in agreeing, whereas conciliator is more like an interventionist because conciliator provides probable solutions to the parties a mediator cannot. So essentially the difference between mediator and conciliator is in terms of the role played by neutral third party. Our law, ancestral model law, we recognize that the role of mediator is not proactive. It is somewhat less than the role of conciliator. We can see all this in part 3 of the Arbitration Conciliation Act. We discussed it in the last lecture. That the role of conciliator, the powers of conciliator are larger than those of mediator. How? Because conciliator can suggest proposals for settlement, which mediator cannot do. So, conciliator can make proposals for settlement. Conciliator can formulate, reformulate the terms of a possible settlement. Mediator does not have to do it. 
All this is allowed in section 73 if you recall. Conciliator has to formulate the terms of settlement. Conciliator has to reformulate the terms of settlement. And if parties request, conciliator may even draw up the settlement agreement. On these aspects, conciliation is different from mediation. Therefore, mediation is more informal. Mediation is more informal where mediator only facilitates the settlement between the parties Mediator does not play a very proactive role. The role of mediator is only to bring parties close to the settlement. No proposals can be made by the mediator. Terms of settlement shall not be decided by the mediator. It shall not be formulated. It shall not be reformulated by the mediator. So therefore, essentially, these two principles are same because these two involve neutral third party to induce and settlement between the parties, but these are different on the point of role played by the neutral third party. In conciliation, the role is more proactive. In mediation, the role is only to facilitate parties to settle their dispute. You have various models of mediation. Facilitative mediation, evaluative, transformative. Then you have Hybrid forms of mediation, court annex mediation, mediation in the context of section 89. Let's quickly understand what these kinds of models of mediations mean. A facilitative mediator assumes that his principal aim is to clarify and enhance communication between the parties in order to help them decide what to do. So therefore, the role of mediator is to facilitate. That's it. Facilitate what? Communication between the parties. Second is evaluative mediation. Evaluative mediation is the process in which the mediator encourages parties to evaluate the merits of their claim. And once parties are in a position to evaluate merits of their claim, a fair settlement is very much likely. So, evaluative mediation is one when, where the mediator encourages parties to evaluate merits of their claims and inspires a fair settlement. Transformative mediation is a recent phenomena where party empowerment is the central theme. Empowerment of parties is the main concern. So, after the mediation, when parties go out, they must feel empowered. That is the main concern of mediator in transformative mediation. Then you have hybrid form of mediation. We will talk about MEDAR. We will talk about some other hybrid processes in our next lecture. MEDAR is a process which starts with the process of mediation. If mediation does not succeed, the process converts into arbitration. It is also gradually gaining importance nowadays. There is nothing bad if we can club the advantages of various basic processes to create a hybrid, processes, hybrid process. Next is court annexed mediation. There is an example given here, example of order 32A of CPC. In the case of FCONS Infrastructure Limited versus Cherian Varke Construction Company, this is 2010 Supreme Court, in which the Supreme Court says that Order 32A of CPC obligates the courts dealing with family matters, matrimonial maintenance, adoption matters, or even succession and legacy matters to make an endeavor in the first instance where it is possible to do so consistently with the nature of the case, to assist the parties in arriving at a settlement. This is an example of court annexed mediation. The court is obliged under Order 32A of CPC, the court which is entertaining the family matters, matrimonial matters, succession matters, the court is obliged where it is possible to do so to assist the parties in arriving at a settlement. 
this is this model of mediation can be called as quote annexed mediation and the last in this list is mediation in the context of section 89 of civil procedure code i already mentioned that in relation to such mediation rules have been framed so these are the various models of mediation facilitative mediation where the main responsibility of mediator is to enhance communication between the parties evaluative mediation where mediator encourages the parties to evaluate their claims transformative mediation focuses on empowerment the parties must go out of mediation process feeling empowered hybrid form of mediation example is medarb code annex mediation i gave you that example of order 32 capital a of cpc the case of fcons infrastructure limited and the last one in this list is mediation in the context of section 89 of cpc what characters must be there what features must be there in a mediator a mediator has to discover a solution he doesn't have to propose a solution a mediator has to discover a solution and he knows that the solution which he is going to discover is not going to be a binding solution but he must discover a solution which is acceptable which is durable and therefore in order to do that he must have certain characters which are essential to the success of mediation the most important character is impartiality the ability to work without bias in addition to impartiality the mediator must have skills and competence with respect to subject in dispute if it is a matter related to intellectual property the mediator must have skills and knowledge in the subject of intellectual property so impartiality neutrality skill and competence in the area of dispute in addition to it he must know about human conflicts also we understand that these conflicts are, are the result of selfishness ego etc so therefore the mediator must also understand the subject of human conflicts confidentiality as i said is the hallmark of the process of mediation so everything which is disclosed to mediator has to be maintained in confidence and as i have said in past it is the confidentiality which encourages the parties to disclose everything to the mediator if you recall i said the biggest problem the biggest challenge in negotiation is parties don't tend to disclose everything to the other party they don't want to bring every interest on the table and there lies the importance of mediator mediator by inducing them that convincing them that things will re remain confidential will ensure that parties disclose everything to them whether in a joint meeting or in a caucus parties disclose everything including trade secrets a mediator must be a good listener i will i will explain later on how listening is a very important stage in mediation he needs to have patience in abundance there are qualities like honesty straightforwardness when he is disclosing about his qualification the confidentiality the fees the rules which he is going to apply when he is disclosing these things to the parties in the opening meeting he has to be very honest he has to be straightforward because he has to generate confidence in parties parties must be confident about the ability and neutrality of the mediator with these qualities a mediator will be in a position to induce a settlement which will be acceptable to the parties and which will have durability the main technique used by mediator during the mediation procedure is communication this is the main technique which a mediator uses and this communication technique is useful in all the stages of mediation from beginning when the mediation commences to the stage of settlement agreement so through from beginning to the stage when parties come out with a resolution throughout the process communication is the most important tool which a mediator uses and what do we mean by communication it has got various parts listening summarizing 
reframing, effective questioning, dealing with emotions, these are some of the aspects which are connected with the tool of communication. Now, let us understand these one after the other. The first point is listening. A, a skilled mediator will engage in active listening. What do we mean by listening? He must stop talking. He must focus on the speaker. He must maintain eye contact, attentive posture. He must acknowledge what is being said or suggested by the parties. He has to acknowledge emotions. He has to look for non-verbal cues. He has to empathize, clarify and most importantly, he has to avoid assumptions. He has to summarize. All these are included in the ability of the mediator to listen. Active listening is an important skill. It is part of the process of communication. The second is summarizing. Summarizing means reflecting back to the speaker. Summarizing means reflecting back to the speaker what? the essence of the communication, what has been, whatever has been discussed, whatever has been said, the mediator has to summarize, reflect it back to the speaker. Summarizing has various benefits. When you summarize, reflect back to the speaker, the speaker feels heard. He feels that somebody is listening to him. It helps in transition to new topic. When you summarize, the topic appears to have been concluded and then you get a chance to move on to the new topic. Summarizing helps in identifying underlying emotions, concerns. Summarizing suggests parties, encourages parties or makes parties to feel that progress has been made. These are the tricks, these are the qualities which are required. Listening, active listening. Summarizing gives a kind of satisfaction to the party. He feels that he is being heard. Somebody is listening to him. And most importantly, summarizing helps the mediator to move on to the next stop. The next aspect is dealing with emotions. All these are aspects of dimensions of communication as a tool in mediation. This is one of the most difficult tasks of mediator to deal with emotions. If the mediator fails to acknowledge the emotional aspect of the dispute, it is likely that the entire process may fail. Mind, the chance of success of ADR is low when the emotions are high. So it is therefore the job of mediator to deal with the emotions of the parties. Next is effective questioning. Effective questioning is used by the mediator to gather precise information because parties may take you to stories which may not be connected with the process. They may start relating the dispute to n number of other stories. There lies the importance of effective questioning for gathering precise information, understanding the situation and closing in on a decision. Effective questioning helps. The next important thing is reframing. Reframing involves changing the statement. This is important from negative to positive. The negative statements presented by the parties will be converted, reframed into positive statements by the arbitrator. That's the skill which the mediator must have. This is an aspect, important aspect of communication as a tool. So statements will be reframed from negative to positive, from past to present, changing the statement from position to interests. As long as parties are talking about rights, it is difficult to settle the problem. So therefore, the right-based stories have to be changed into interest-based stories. Positions have to be changed into interests. The past narratives have to be changed into present stories. 
and negative statements have to be changed into positive statements. All this is called as reframing. These are the important characteristics, as I said, the most important tool in mediation which is used in every stage of mediation is communication. And communication means listening, communication means summarizing, it means dealing with emotions, communication means effective questioning, communication means reframing. Now, let us quickly see what are the different stages of conducting mediation. I will quickly rush through the, these stages. First stage is beginning the mediation session. The mediator has to open negotiation between the parties. Mediator has to establish an open and positive tone. Mediation, mediator has to establish ground rules and behavioral guidelines. What are the rules of the mediation process? What shall be the behavior of the parties? Venting of emotions is done at this stage. Issues are discussed and mediator shall assist the parties in exploring commitments. These are the initial steps which have to be done in stage 1. The rules have to be finalized. Behaviors have been clarified. Topics have been delimited. Issues have been identified. The second stage is setting an agenda, defining issues, identify broad topic areas of concern to the parties you see on the screen, obtain agreement on the issues to be discussed, obtain the agreement of the parties on issues to be discussed, identify the sequence of issues to be handled. Stage 3 is uncovering hidden interest of the disputing parties, that is not an easy job. Mediator has to identify the interests, psychological interests of the parties, substantive interest of the parties and then there is another very important role, educate the parties about each other's interest. That is a different thing to do. There lies a lot of skill. It requires a lot of skill on the part of mediator to identify the hidden interests and to educate parties about each other's interests. Stage 4 is generating options for settlement. It involves developing an awareness among the parties of the need for multiple options. I have already mentioned the importance of this point. Parties must keep on inventing options, generating options. There must not be a dead end. If you start insisting on one particular option and without willing and, or, and you are not willing to invent or go beyond that option, there may be a situation that mediation may fail. So, therefore, it is the role of mediator to make parties aware about generating multiple options. Keep thinking about options, options for settlement. Generate options either using positional or interest-based bargaining. Interest-based bargaining is a good approach. Right-based approach is not advisable. As a rule, every dispute resolution mechanism must adopt interest-based bargaining. If that is not working, then only we can go to right-based approach. And ultimately, if nothing works, then comes this stage of exerting power. Stage number five is assessing options for settlement. You have generated a lot of options. Now it is the time to assess those options, review the interest of the parties, Assess how interests can be met by available options. What are the interests which parties want to be protected? I have five interests. The other party may have three interests. Find out the interests. See which option better serves your interest. Then assess the cost and benefit of selecting options. What are the interests? The options which you have generated out of these options, which option better serves the interests of both the parties? What is the What are the costs and benefits associated with some option which the parties are willing to accept? All this has to be done in stage 5. Once we have zeroed down to option to settlement, we have understood the interests which have to be fulfilled. Then comes the stage of final bargaining. In final bargaining, what happens? There is incremental 
convergence of position. Parties held positions in the beginning. Mediator takes them closer by generating multiple options. They have come very close to each other. There is a possibility that parties may meet here. This convergence will finally be done in this stage called as final bargaining. On the basis of interests, on the basis of the options which have been generated. Once a final bargaining is done, some settlement is arrived at, then comes a formal stage of achieving a formal settlement. Formalize the settlement and create an enforcement and commitment mechanism. The settlement arrived at by the parties have to be formalized and we will have to create a mechanism for its enforcement and commitment. Why am I saying that we need to create a mechanism for its enforcement? Because as of now, we don't have a law which provides for enforcement of settlement agreement arising out of mediation process. Once we have a law which provides for enforcement, we don't have to talk about it. We don't have to create a mechanism for its enforcement. The mechanism will be there as part of the law which we will create. So therefore, there is an agreement created and there is formal settlement agreement prepared. As I have been saying, in India, there is no law which provides for recognition and enforcement of settlement agreement. We have part 3 for conciliation. Part 3 of Arbitration Conciliation Act for conciliation, which talks about the enforcement of settlement agreement. Settlement agreement under conciliation shall be enforced in the manner same as Section 30, the settlement award, it is just like any other award on agreed terms. This aspect is missing with respect to mediation. Most of the mediation settlement agreements are enforced voluntarily without court proceedings. The statutory mediation is dealt under civil procedure mediation rules. I said Section 89, Section 89 mediation is dealt under civil procedure mediation rules. Those rules provide that the settlement agreement which is duly signed and attested will have the status of decree that is enforceable by the court. But that is only with respect to the mediation under section 89. I have identified certain statutes which provide for mediation. For example, the Industrial Disputes Act, the Hindu Marriage Act, you can see on the screen, the Family Courts Act, the Special Marriage Act the Legal Services Authority Act, the Companies Act 2013, all these provide for mediation. The Companies Mediation and Conciliation Rules 2016 have been framed in relation to mediation to be done under the Companies Act. Again, the Real Estates Regulation and Development Act, RERA 2016, that also talks about mediation as a mode of dispute resolution. Most importantly, the Commercial Courts Act 2015, the Commercial Courts Act 2015, it contains, we have made the rules, the Commercial Courts Pre-Institution Mediation and Settlement Rules 2018, Section 12A of Commercial Courts Act provides that, except for a suit which contemplates urgent interim relief under the Act, except for this situation, in all other cases, no suit is to be instituted unless the plaintiff exhausts the remedy of pre-institution mediation according to the manner prescribed. So pre-institution mediation is a mandatory requirement under Commercial Courts Act 2015. We need to bring in place a codified law on mediation. I have already mentioned it in the present lecture. We understood the basic concept of mediation. We identified various legislations which provide for mediation. In the next lecture, we shall discuss some of the hybrid modes of resolution of dispute where we will be trying to mix the advantages of mediation with the advantages of other modes of dispute resolution. That is all on the topic of mediation. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you.
Hello, good morning everybody. I am uh, Raghunandan Sengupta. So, I will just give you uh, the a very brief uh, excitement area of finance which is quantitative finance and that has a huge market starting around about 10 years back and it is exploding exponentially. So, what uh, do we mean by quantitative finance? Quantitative finance is actually the application of different mathematical and statistical techniques in the area of financial markets, be it say for example, derivative pricing, be it in the area of say for example, portfolio management, be it in the area of asset liability management, be it in the area of portfolio management. We see that the application has exploded in such a way that there is a huge opportunity for people who have a quantitative background in mathematics and statistics, they can utilize those in the area of finance, but obviously with some prior knowledge of, of, of uh, finance as a subject. Now, when we say about quantitative finance, as I said, it is an area of applied mathematics and statistics applied in, in financial markets. Use of different areas, if somebody is interested to know, we have stochastic calculus, we have derivative pricing, we have operation research, we have quantitative techniques like differential uh, equations, stochastic calculus, time series, and they are heavily used in the area of quantitative finance as I mentioned. Now, we all know that in 2000, in 1997, the Nobel Prize in Economics, so it is basically the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics was given to the work of Merton and Scholz in the area of derivative pricing. And after that, there has been an exponential increase in the area of, of quantitative techniques in, in, in quantitative finance and the, in the area of, of different type of derivative pricing. With the advent, moreover with the advent of, of high ended and sophisticated computing data, big data has come in a very big way where application areas starting from computing from different type of algorithm design have been taken up in such a big way that nowadays at least we are able to understand that how high frequency data algorithm trading can be utilized using the concept of quantitative finance in the area of, of finance as such. But there is a flip side also, obviously when, when, when there is a huge amount of development, so obviously due to some regulation errors or something, there has been some, some pitfalls, which I think is should be a bullet point for people who are in really interested to take up quantity finance, they should be aware. So, consider the financial crisis in 2008 and later on and we are seeing different banks are failing, different financial institutions are facing a problem. Countries are facing a problem like in Europe, in, 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 in USA. So, what should be done? So, the main thing is that even if you know the technique is best for people who are investors, who are private players, organizations like banks, government should use these techniques in a very somber manner such that the application areas of quantitative finance using the techniques which we learned can be utilized in the best possible way to garner the overall the in-depth knowledge a person has in trying to utilize these quantitative techniques in finance. And I am sure that people who have the background, who have the knowledge, who have the, the sophistication, who have the, the knowledge of the society can definitely use quantitative finance in a very big way in trying to make their mark in this exciting field which you are going to see in years to come. And I am sure it will be a very exciting learning tool for all the participants who, who will take quantitative finance as a, as, a, as a subject in years to come. Thank you and I, am, and I wish all the participants all the best and best of luck for the programs they will take. Thank you.